All right, welcome everyone. We are going to go ahead and get started with today's Professional Athlete Care Team Grand Round Session. Uh, today we are very excited uh, to welcome Dr. Randall Wright to present on um, the first of a series um, on an athlete's brain. So Dr. Wright is going to be presenting the power of sleep and exercise on the field and off. So a little bit about the Center for Sport, for those of you that may not know about us, the Center for Sport is backed by Tulane University and relationships with local, national, and professional sports organizations. The Center for Sport has developed an interdisciplinary network of resources, knowledge, and experience all under one roof here at Tulane. It puts us in a unique position to view sport from a 360 degree perspective. Uh, at the center, our work promotes cross-campus connections that allow us to examine, cru examine crucial problems facing athletes, sport, and society, as well as developing careers and innovative answers to issues that affect the sports industry. Um, university professionals from every academic and practice area at Tulane engage their expertise and collaborate to advance our mission. Our mission includes three main Objectives to educate current and future professionals in all areas of the sports industry to improve the emotional and physical lives of athletes by advancing cutting edge sports research and health services and to inspire social change by promoting the powerful impact of sport and the role of athletes in communities. Okay, so um, Dr. Wright is joining us from as the director of brain health and sleep program, program from Houston Methodist Hospital in the Woodlands Houston Neurological Institute. Um, Dr. Wright did spend some time in New Orleans where he um, attended Xavier University. So he has been here in New Orleans. Um, he received his bachelor's of science in physics from Xavier, then went on to get a dual degree in an engineering program at Georgia Institute of Technology. He graduated from Emory University School of Medicine in 1998. He is a board certified, uh, Amer certified for sleep medicine, psychiatry, and neurology. Um, Dr. Wright um, is very active in the community sector. He is the, was the organizer and chairman Child Health Obesity Forum at Houston Community College. Dr. Wright was inspired, after serving in this role, he was inspired to create a new program for inner city children that engages them on a regular basis to increase physical activity and improve healthy eating habits. He has published several books, um, the first being The Right Choice, Your Family Prescription to Healthy Eating, Modern Fitness and Saving Money. Um, he appears regularly on la local and no national media sources. He has writings and interviews have been featured in Health Today, MSN.com, U.S. News and World Report, WebMD, Daily Mail Online, and 20 other media outlets. Um, Dr. Wright currently serves as the director of the Houston Methodist Brain Wellness and Sleep Program, where he is focusing on preventative disease efforts that affect the nervous system while raising community awareness of such steps. And through decades of diligent research, exploration, and action with agencies such as NASA, the American Heart Association, and 100 Black Men, Dr. Randall Wright has compiled a wealth of knowledge that informs his holistic health initiatives. Uh, today, Dr. Wright's mission continues to marry science-backed principles of health with real life implementation to reduce dramatically the prevalence of heart disease, stroke, and dementia while witnessing an improved quality of lives around the world. So um, just to give you a little bit of information about today's session, uh, Dr. Wright is going to share his presentation with us. We will be doing a Q&A session at the end that will be happening through the Q&A feature that all 
uh, participants, you can type your question there and we will filter through those at the end. So um, please do assist me in welcoming Dr. Randall Wright. We're going to do a switch of share screen and get started from there. I will say just in case, because um, I know Dr. Wright's going to be excited to get into his presentation, Dr. Wright did complete a disclosure and conflict of interest, and he has nothing to disclose on today's presentation. All right. Okay. All right. Are we in the driver's seat here? You are. You can awesome. go ahead and share your screen. Let's see here. Can you see anything now? Make sure. Not yet. Okay, let's come here. Let's share my screen. And let me know when you see something. Yes, we can see, yep. Awesome, all righty. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for for spending time with us today. I'm coming from Houston. Um, I know we're in New Orleans. I wish I was in New Orleans right now. It'd be a fun place, but we're a different part of the world right now. So we'll do it via the teleconference, which is becoming, I guess, a norm in our society now. So I, I'm excited um, to be here to speak to you today about one of my favorite topics. Um, I love the brain, I love sports, and so this is a great way to combine my two passions and have a chance to, to give some interesting dialogue today. So as, as Teresa said, I have no disclaimers or disclosures. Um, this is a talk more about science than anything else. So I think we should be able to have a fun intellectual conversation. I hope to stimulate some minds and go from there. All right, so she mentioned a little bit about NASA. This is not a NASA picture. This is taken a few weeks ago with my family as we were watching the SpaceX launch. And um, that was a, a very fun time for me because I had a chance to actually watch a, a, a mission launch. A friend of mine as, as an astronaut, and he went up on STS-36. So my son, who's on the right here, um, here, he was, I think, maybe two at the time. We all went down there and watched it. Um, but it was an exciting time. I've always loved the space program. It's just amazing to me how NASA does that, and in this case, SpaceX. And there's a lot to launching a rocket. Um, there's, it's a lot of physics. I was a physics major as an undergrad, and I can appreciate the complexity of this diagram and to see what it takes to launch a missile, to get it off the ground, to, to have it go over a certain parabolic arch and then to have it come down safely somewhere else. Um, in my, I love to daydream. I always wonder what was it, what would it be like to actually try to catch a rocket? You ever thought about trying to catch a rocket? How hard that would be? Um, you have to kind of anticipate where it's going to land, what are you going to do with it? Um, there's a lot to it. Then I thought about it some more. I was like, you know what? People catch rockets actually every single day. All across America, people catch these projectile um, objects, not in the form of NASA, but as sports. Every time a quarterback reaches back, throws a ball, it's a calculation that goes on. In the mind of a wide receiver or a baseball player who's catching a ball, they have to calculate the arc of the, of the ball, where it's going to land, anticipate any changes in the wind, and Get, be there right at the exact time to catch that ball. Now, of course, we never think about that, right? You know, here's my son playing basketball, and um, let's see who's going to play for us. He just does it. He just up there, throws it in there as if it's nothing, right? Does it all the time, every single day. And we never think about how complex that task really is. Have you seen computers do that yet? Have we seen robots do that yet? to catch a ball, to catch a missile, to catch anything, that's pretty complex. So to me, it really speaks to the core of how complex our brains really are and how often we take it for granted that our brains do these calculations every single second of the day and we think nothing of it. And so I spent my life really trying to find the connection between technology and medicine, specifically the brain and to see how can we either improve it, prevent disease, 
are just do things that are amazing with that regards. So today we're gonna to speak about a slightly different topic. Now, most times when you hear the brain and you hear neurology, it's about concussions, right? That's the big thing that people usually think about when we do brain and sports. But we're gonna go a different direction today. We're gonna to go more into thinking about what an athlete's brain is really like and the power that we can do to either harness it, enhance it, or just understand it better. So as a brain wellness doctor, which means that I spend a lot of my time trying to figure out how do we prevent brain disease, not just treat it, but how do we understand it and prevent it? And of course, we've over time, you've heard about a variety of, of aspects or cornerstones or pillars you may hear about that, that promote brain health. Um, so we're going to discuss that briefly today and specifically focus on two aspects, sleep and exercise. So traditionally, you hear that there are usually about six pillars that you may hear. The Cleveland Clinic gives six pillars of brain health, which are typically sleep, exercise, macro and micronutrients, dietary restrictions, mental exercise, and even stress relief, right? We know now that on a disease side, um, that there are several factors that are negative for brain health. The lack of physical activity, excessive caloric intake, and even cognitive apathy are not stimulating your brain for higher levels of thought. All those things can be negative for the brain. We, in our practice, like to kind of reformulate how we think about it to a simpler version. And we call it the dyads of health. So we like to think about the three dyads of brain health, sleep and exercise, dietary consumption and restriction, and mental activity, and mental realization. Because in our minds, or in our view of the world, that there's always a yin and a yang of things. There's always a good and a bad, there's always an up and a down, and it's the balance between those two that really makes it work. So you can't just sleep and not exercise. You can't just consume healthy foods, but not also restrict what you're taking. You can't also always be mentally active, but then never take time to relax. So we look at it as a ebb and flow of things. And today we're gonna to focus on just two of these, or just one of the dyads, specifically sleep and exercise, and specifically as it relates to athletes. And so that's gonna be our, our talking points for today. And so walk with me through this journey as we think about what's an athlete's brain like and how sleep and exercise can um, be beneficial for them. So sleep, as a sleep physician, and I'll tell you, during this coronavirus, I have had more conversations and interviews about sleep than really any other topic because everybody was home and you think we could get sleep at home, but no one slept at home. What we're doing, we're up watching Netflix, we're out hanging out, we're doing cocktails, all kinds of things were going on that disrupted our sleep. But really sleep is a super important part of our life. I think of it as the three R's. It's supposed to rejuvenate, it's supposed to restore, and it's supposed to re-energize us. And so when we look at sleep, when we don't have these three R's, then our brains just really don't function properly, right? It affects almost everything, our physiological well-being, our psychological well-being and processes. It affects our performance in work, in school, and in life. It affects our ability to be socially and emotionally connected to others. And that's why it's been very interesting as we've been all on lockdown in the past, how the lack of sleep and the social isolation really made for a, a, little, a little gumbo, if you will, for those in Louisiana, of, um, of problems that we've seen. Um, and it improves our learning and memory. Um, you know, many people who are in medicine who have taken call and who have had lack of sleep can, attest can testify how we don't think quite straight when we're tired. Um, and we can see that pretty immediately. Um, and it does help to reduce health problems and optimize our health. So I can't overstate how important sleep is. Um, in general, this is a little brief review, um, just for your information. You know, our sleep requirements will vary by age. As we get older, um, you know, when we're young, we sleep a lot. Newborns sleep a ton. Um, and then as we get older, it, it reduces to, as an adult, about seven to nine hours of sleep on average, 
right? And then as we get older into our older population, that number can vary. That number sometimes goes down. So, so it's, it's varied um, throughout our lifetime. This is a touch about sleep architecture. There are different stages of sleep and each stage of sleep has some technical things that goes on during those, that stage. Um, for example, we believe that during stage three is when we consolidate memories. It's when the brain starts doing housekeeping and, and kind of get rid of old, unuseful connections and re-solidifying ones that are more useful or more pertinent to us. In stage REM sleep is when we dream. It stands for rapid eye movement. It's believed that that's when the brain is untethered in our thoughts. And that's why you can fly, you can do amazing things. And from what I've told and read, a lot of inspiration for new ideas come during REM sleep. So it's a, it's a fascinating part of our existence that I love to think about, that what can we do if we get more REM? So it sounds like a t-shirt tag, right? But anyway, so now sleep disorders can vary and they exist in a variety of age groups, not just older people, but our athletes can also experience some sleep problems. So we're not gonna go through all of these different sleep problems because it's not in the context of our athletic conversation here, but I will kind of, will highlight a couple of them. One in particular, um, sleep apnea. Sleep apnea affects in general 10% of our population um, and it's typically thought to be a disease of being overweight, but not necessarily. The other one I'm gonna highlight today is insomnia which is by far a very common complaint. And really over this last COVID crisis was one of my most common complaints in the clinic was people just couldn't sleep. And that's a whole different conversation we could have, but there are a lot of varieties for that. Now, I'm gonna kind of, I want to show this video, but I'm gonna highlight a little bit about what this video shows. This is put out by Harvard. Um, and it was one that was highlighting um, Turn it down a little bit. It was highlighting sleep apnea. And I know you know this guy, we all do, Shaquille O'Neal. Um, and he was diagnosed, as we all know, with sleep apnea. And it goes through his experience um, having the condition um, and going through a sleep study and of that nature. Um, I thought it was fascinating and touching um, that they shared this story of him going through the sleep study um, and having the bravery to show it live on television. Um, I mean, on, on, the, on the program here. So it's a very common condition that affects many individuals. You're not always overweight. You can be very muscular and athletic um, and still have it. But it's one that many athletes do have. A lot of football players that I've experienced have a chance to work with have had sleep apnea. You want to keep that in mind. Um, on the other side, insomnia. Athletes oftentimes suffer from insomnia, and there are a lot of reasons for this. Um, rigorous training schedules, travel obligations, time zone change. If you're a West Coast um, team and you go into the East Coast, and we'll discuss that more in a second, uh, that those could have major impacts on your performance. Um, Athletes oftentimes downplay the importance of sleep. I would argue not just athletes, but many people would downplay the importance of sleep. You think that's oh, not important. You know, we're going to burn that midnight oil, on burn the candles on both ends and not recognize that when we chronically don't get enough sleep, our performance actually goes down. And I hope to articulate that to you in a second. Um, in this new age of electronic devices, we have had a new player on the market for causes for insomnia, that's smartphones, and we'll discuss that in a little bit. And of course, in the athletic milieu or environment, stress and anxiety is another major risk factor or, or, or cause for uh, insomnia. So let's dive into some, some, some talk to topics here. So the negative effects of sleep deprivation, i.e. insomnia, when we, when we don't get enough sleep. So most of those, as we discussed, uh, earlier, need, needs about seven to nine hours of sleep. Um, athletes, possibly more. Some studies suggest that athletes need much more sleep than, than the regular non-athletic individuals. So some of the negative effects of sleep can include 
cardiovascular problems. Um, on the side of sleep apnea, for example, a lot of individuals sometimes have these enlarged hearts. And we've, you know, all of us have heard, unfortunately, individuals who may have been playing football or some sport and who had problems on the field only to find that they had a cardiomyopathy that was, you know, found to have undiagnosed sleep apnea. So it is important to screen individuals for cardiac um, abnormalities and specifically for sleep apnea. Um, sleep deprivation can affect our immune system. We've been shown in studies that, that sleep deprivation can increase pro-inflammatory cytokines, which is not good. You don't want things inflaming in the brain. Um, so when that happens, it sets the stage down the line for lots of problems. If it's in the brain, maybe dementias, um, if it's in the body, other kinds of problems there. Um, it can interfere with muscle recovery. So individuals who chronically sleep deprive themselves may not recover as quickly from, image, from, from injury or damage that they may have had playing a sport. Um, and it can alter your pain perception. Um, people can sometimes perceive pain more because they have this inflammation going on and it, they just hurt more. So it can affect you in that direction. On the metabolic side of things, it can cause metabolic dysfunctions, which includes risk factors for developing diabetes, obesity, glucose sensitivity can be altered when we have sleep deprivation, which affects protein synthesis, which can ultimately affect our appetite and our food intake and food choices. Um, it can make you crave unhealthy foods, right? So when we're hungry and you're sleepy and you're tired, or sorry, when you're sleepy and you're tired because you're sleep deprived, you start craving those caffeine you know, influenced um, um, foods or you start craving things with your carbs because it makes you comfortable. Lots of things can, can go awry when you are sleep deprived, especially your, your appetite and your cravings. Um, and you know, to an athlete's chagrin, it can also affect growth hormones and cortisol secretion, which may affect your physical development. Um, so there are lots of problems metabolically that can occur if we are sleep deprived. So we need to make sure that we're not. Um, on the cognitive side, which is kind of my area of, um, of, of interest the most is it impairs brain function, right? As we mentioned, I hinted at earlier, when I was a resident and I was taking call all night long, um, those, those post-call days were horrible, right? Because you couldn't concentrate. And, and I was a resident at the time when the, the laws for residency changed from that you, could, that you had to take call all night and take call several times during the week to when they started putting parameters on how much call you could take because you realized that it's not safe for physicians to be, taking, to be treating patients after being called all night for seven nights in a row. So, so luckily, our own profession has recognized the the problems with, with, with sleep deprivation and made adjustments to make sure that we have protections against that. Um, you can start to make poor judgments. Decision-making skills is affected. And if you're a player and you're trying to make split-second decisions, um, that's affected. Um, you get slower in your cognition. So what, what you could do you know, really quickly um, if you're asleep, if you're adequately enough sleep, you can't do sometimes when you're sleep deprived um, and your performance is less accurate. So, you know, trying to throw that, that projectile and trying to catch it, you're less accurate if you're sleep deprived. So this just to me builds the case for why sleep is important, especially in the athletic population, because when you don't get it, you're going to suffer the consequences. Um, this is just a list um, of studies that have highlighted the different effects of, of, of sleep deprivation. And I'll just kind of highlight a few. Um, you can see that, you know, that when you have sleep deprivation, you can affect psychomotor function. Um, you can get significant less decrease in, in how much you can lift under certain bench pressing devices with this study highlighted. Um, you um, have mood changes, you have deprivation of sleep can affect your power. Your minute ventilation can be affected. Your total running distance can be affected. So it's not, it's every, every aspect of sports can be touched by poor sleep. Um, it's not just the big sports, it's every sports can be affected. So I think this is just a, just a, a wake up call that athletes can't just ignore sleep. 
it is important to get it. Um, and then on the positive side, there's always a flip side, right? So if lack of sleep is bad, what does getting adequate sleep or improved sleep look like? And in this case, you can see that, you know, with this study by Hamdar, that they had improved reaction times, you know, fatigue was decreased, right? Alertness was, in, was found to be improved. So there are just a lot of, a lot of benefits that you can get um, from, from sleep. You know, with, with Ma, half court and full court sprints were improved. So you're getting speed, you're getting agility, can be improved with adequate sleep. Um, circadian effects of sleep. Um, our bodies have a natural clock. Um, it's called the circadian rhythm and it affects our biological function. Um, so sleeping outside of your body's rhythm can lead to poor sleep, which me meaning that, you know, our bodies are designed to, to be awake during the day and to sleep at nighttime. When we don't do that, i.e. if you're a shift worker, for example, and you work nighttime and you sleep during the day, yeah, you're getting the same amount of sleep, the same timing, but the quality can be affected because our brains were designed to sleep when it's dark and be awake when it's light time. Um, now, in the athletic population, jet lag is a common disruptor of our body's circadian rhythm. Um, and we can see this when athletes travel through different time zones. And we'll take a look at that here. So the NFL did a study by Dr. Smith, um, and they studied games that that he had East Coast teams who played West Coast teams and vice versa. And what happens, right? So they found that, so when these teams did these cross continental travels, when the game was, when the games were played at around one in the afternoon or 4 p.m. in the afternoon, um, there wasn't much difference, right? That, that, that early afternoon game, you know, not a whole lot of difference here. However, evening games, much different story. The East Coast teams were consistently are consistently performed worse when they were on the West Coast. And if you can imagine this, right? If you had an evening game on the West Coast and you're an East Coast trained athlete, you think about it, you could be playing a game close to 2 a.m. on your biological clock. It was an evening game um, and, and in the West Coast time, but your biological clock is several hours ahead. And so you're playing a game with your body feeling it's 2 a.m. when it's really not. And that has um, just drastic effects on your performance. Um, and this effect was seen over 40 years that this study was retrospectively reviewed for um, in NFL football. And it was consistent that the teams consistently did worse when they were East Coast teams playing on the West Coast, even vice versa. So I thought that was a fascinating point to show that just the mere fact that these individuals weren't sleeping quite well and had this alteration in their circadian bio clock affected their performance. Um, so, you know, just quick tips on how do we mitigate jet lag? It's one, one thing is sun exposure. That the sun is a major regulator for circadian rhythms um, and that new time zones when we get there to expose yourself to the sun. Um, bringing on familiar objects, you know, maybe bring their favorite teddy bear for the football players, you know, I don't know. But that was one little suggestion. And even melatonin may be helpful um, for it. Um, but I think it's, but even mitigating jet lag is to me an example of how as individuals who are in the sports world, once we are able to identify potential problems to our performance, we can start to do mitigating factors and train and, and change maybe how we train and change maybe how we engage in these athletes to make sure that they are functioning at an optimal level given their situations. Um, just a few of the things that, that, that point to that is sleep hygiene. Now we tell our patients this all the time and you can read through and see you know, some, some quick sleep tips. Um, these are simple things that we do um, in regards to treating regular patients for sleep problems. You know, avoid nighttime caffeine if possible, don't smoke cigarettes, um, and avoid high intensity exercise right before going to bed. That's a sticking point for athletes. And I know that they have their training regimen and schedule of, of sorts, 
but to make sure that those regimens really, really follow those kind of suggestions. Um, and how they work in the dorm room, you know, or wherever they're living is quiet and dark. So there are several things that we can recommend um, to help prevent um, sleeping problems. Diving a little bit deeper into a more modern approach too, is the natural, is the light. Many athletes and their studies that suggest that, you know, being professional or collegiate, you know, do a lot of their talking about their sports day at nighttime on their devices with their friends before they go to bed. And so, you know, they're up on their smartphones and they're texting and we recognize that the, the, the white, the, the blue light from the phone is actually along the spectrum of light that actually decreases the melatonin production, i.e. promotes wakefulness, right? So in addition to what you're looking at on the phone, which may stress you out a little bit because you're being competitive, the actual light itself may keep you awake. And so the recommendations that athletes shouldn't have their phones before they go to bed um, is one that we always talk about. Um, and for us in general, you know, no TVs in the bedroom, no phones in the bedroom, no iPads, no devices, all those things, because that light can affect your sleeping or you can put a filter on it, it can also help. But in general, just try to avoid devices in the bedroom before you go to bed. So there are lots of things that we can look to retool how we, how we approach an athlete um, in regards to their, to their sleep schedule. Now, going to the other side of the, the yin to the yang side, let's look at exercise. So our higher cognitive functions in humans are complex and have been around for a long time. The ability of our brain to, to, to really plan complex behaviors, to make decisions, to process emotions and to interact on a social level requires a tremendous amount of energy. Now, although our brain is only about 2% of our total body weight, it accounts for about 20% of, the in, of our body's energy requirements. Um, and among that, it's mainly the neurons. The glial cells, which by far outnumber the neurons, um, the neurons use most of the energy. So the neurons are just a, just a protected, a, a, a special a cell um, that does a lot for us. And I think we'll, we'll focus a little bit of time talking about it right now. So organisms tend to allocate their available energy among competing needs. We have a need for maintenance in our body. We have to repair injured muscle. We have to grow. If you're a young person who's you know, you know, an adolescent, you're growing, you're, you're physically getting bigger, you're physically getting taller, um, and that requires energy. Reproduction, we got reproductive organs that are constantly turning over um, gametocytes and, and that needs energy to do as well. And also our brains need energy, uh, particularly for functions of communication, imagination and creativity all that requires energy. And so our, our, brain, our body is really, I wouldn't, it's not competing, but it's deciding how to adequately allocate the proper resources for where to go to give everything what it needs. Now, over the past decade, it's become clear to us at least that, that there are ways to get energy besides just the main energy um, work hard, meaning glucose, that, that neurons can utilize other sources of fuel, um, namely lactate and ketone bodies. And that's very interesting, right? Now the overall contribution from lactate to the brain varies based upon its availability. And I think, and we believe that that's why the brain can do that. That at some points, or parts in our day, we may have you know, less glucose than other points of the day. And so when glucose is less, the brain will convert to using other energy sources. Um, for it. Now, what happens when you exercise? And so when someone is act, being active and, and being energetic, um, so at various exercise intensities, the metabolism of lactate in the brain may be higher in trained subjects when compared to controls. So in studies that looked at athletes, it's suggesting that there is an adaptive mechanism that allows the brain to respond to an alternative pathway it allows them to utilize other sources of energy because they're burning it up on other places. In the adult brain, the, we, can, we can utilize ketones um, is greatly reduced in the fed state, but is increased considerably 
um, when we have limited glucose available, meaning that our bodies, our brains can shift using ketones when we are not fully um, having just a lot of, keto, a lot of uh, carb carbs. So when we're active or when we're fasting, our brains can use ketones instead of, of glucose. So when we exercise, we'll come back to that in a second. When we exercise, what happens in our brain? Um, there's increased metabolism. We have increased norepinephrine. We have increased dopamine production, which is our pleasure and reward um, and neurotransmitter. There's increase in serotonin typically, uh, which is involved in our anxiety pathways. We have increased endorphins. And we see increases in tropic factors such as BDNF, IGF-1, and VEGF. Those all make sense in a second, but there's lots of, there's lots of neural activity goes on when we exercise. What does that do for us practically? Um, well, several studies have been shown that there are, are several cognitive benefits of exercise. Um, that executive function is improved. Our attention processing is improved. Our memory can be improved. Uh, and our ability to learn can be improved. Those four right there has, is what, in my opinion, has marked the onset of brain wellness as, as, as a area of medicine. Because now that we know that when we exercise, we can enhance and improve things, that actually gives us some tools to mitigate certain things, i.e. dementias. We get our patients exercising, right? Um, in, in athletes, um, we have seen our studies suggest that their ability to process information and to focus dramatically improves when they're exercising. Um, and of course, not all exercise plans, plans are the same, but certain ones can really enhance that. And I think that's where my excitement is, is helping to figure out and design what plans may both enhance physical performance and intellectual performance. So it's, it's a fascinating field um, from my vantage point. Um, and looking at studies with neuroimaging, we can see it in real life, like the prefrontal cortex is enhanced. Uh, we get medial temporal cortices are improved um, in, in how they function and, and things from a, from a neuroanatomical and neuroimaging standpoint, even hippocampus from that standpoint. Exercise and mood. Um, we know that empirically we've seen people report that when they exercise, they feel better, right? Well, we studied that, and they studied that, and, and they see that it does hold true. Um, exercise lessens symptoms of individuals suffering from medical conditions such as um, depression, anxiety, um, mood problems. So, so it does regulate our mood, um, it, and for a beneficial um, vantage point. On the inside of the brain, what we do see that's transpiring is we see angiogenesis, we see, which is the formation of new blood cells. We see synaptogenesis, which is creating new connections um, that be, go on between neurons. And the connections are super important. Um, and that's what allows us to remember and to connect. And, and those connections are enhanced during exercise, um, chronic exercise. Mood enhancement, we feel better. Now, this is not just talking about the runner's high that everyone knows it comes from adrenaline. This is, this, these are more systemic changes throughout the brain that over time enhances our sense of well-being. Our, we feel good, our confidence, all those things improve. Pain control. We know that I treat a lot of people with fibromyalgia. Um, and many of those individuals spiral in a sense that it hurts when they move, therefore they don't move as much. And then you fast forward six to 12 months and their pain worsens. Why? Maybe because our natural pain controlling mechanisms that are inactive when we exercise are not being utilized and therefore the brain perception of pain changes. Um, so part of our routine that we get everybody exercising um, and, this, and outside of medication treatment, people with fibromyalgia we've seen really improve uh, when we get them on a proper exercise technique. Um, so pain control is important with chronic exercise. But the part that has really got a lot of us excited in the neuroscience space, which when I was training was heresy, is the fact that we do see the creation of neurogenesis or the creation of new brain cells, new neurons. 
when I trained, it was you had a certain number of brain cells and you got what you got and uh, you get what you get and don't throw a fit as my, as my children say sometimes. But now we see that that's not necessarily the truth, that, that new brain cells have been shown in many studies to, to develop and it develops as a result from exercise. And that's been the beauty of, of why we really promote exercise you know, a lot. So let's dive into what that looks like. Now, we're gonna, we, we, I made hint of this in the past, and we're gonna come back to this in a second. So, you know, at some point in, in our manhood that we were all hunter gatherers, we were running around, um, and it was survival of the fittest, if you will. Um, and, and, we learned to, and we learned that those who did it best were those who were able to, to go out, get food, um, and probably when they were running around getting food, they, may not, they probably weren't eating at that time. So they were in a state of physical activity, um, in a state of probably starvation. And we're seeing that that's probably where our bodies and our brains may have been designed to function the best. In a state of activity, in a state of not over consumption of food, but either average or low consumption of food, hence the onset of why you hear a lot of intermittent fasting and things like that. That's gonna be our second diet that we're gonna discuss in the future. We'll come back to that part of it. But right now, this activity, this, this being active is what we're seeing gets the brain in really its best place. Um, so let's look at neurogenesis. A few case studies as we start to wind, to wrap things up. Um, this is a study um, done back in 2005 um, in which we had exercise mice. Um, and they had mice that exercised and they had mice that did not exercise. And they tried to teach them this water maze and in summary, um, that the mice that exercised were better able um, to navigate this water maze than those mice that weren't when they were controlled in that regard. So basically, age runners um, showed a faster acquisition and better retention of the maze than their aged match controls. Um, on a neuroimaging vantage point, um, exercise enhances learning in the hippocampus. The hippocampus is a part of the brain that, that memory is mainly housed. There's, we have two sides, two lobes, right? Um, so they did slices and stains of the hippocampus and they had it, um, individuals who were runners and those who were not runners from age match. And, and here you can see that they basically looked at the, the, that the, the arborization or how prolific the, um, the connections were and individuals who were aged who were runners, um, young runners, as in this one, they're better than those who were not runners, right? So once again, suggesting that that physical activity and showing that physical activity allows the development of new connections and potentially new neurons as well, hence neurogenesis. Um, biochemical markers. Um, the question is, how, how do we get this neurogenesis? And what they're finding is that when we exercise, certain neurofactors are, in, are, are, are secreted more, specifically brain-derived neurotropic factor, BDNF, um, and then the vascular endothelial growth factor. Um, those two are, are, have been shown to be increased in individuals who have been exercising. Um, interestingly enough, also to by hypoxia has also been shown to, to to generate this. And it makes sense, right? With hypoxia, which is you need more oxygen, which comes from blood vessels, that, that we see that there's an increase in the creation of new blood vessels, our, our angiogenesis, when we have exercise or even some hypoxia. And that's what just suggests that, that the vascular endothelial growth factor acts on the endothelial cells lining the walls and blood vessels and triggers them to divide and produce new blood vessels. These are two precursors to developing new brain cells in the sense that you get the blood flow going and you start to create new, new actual neurons, which is what the BDNF works on. Um, so the question arises, you know, so is a stressed brain actually good for you? And, and some may argue and some do argue that yes, a slightly stressed brain and stress in the fact that you're slightly hypoxic, which occurs when you're exercising, right, um, can in fact help to stimulate the production of 
new brain of, of new blood vessels, as you can see, as you can see in this cartoon, and potentially new neurons as well. So exercise has become a big part of our daily recommendations for our patients who suffer from, from many conditions, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, um, to mitigate loss that occurs as we age or as we have certain dementias. Um, and then if you go on the other side, these may be ways to help improve function um, if you are athletic or, um, or, or um, an athlete. So we say no pain, no brain, if you will. Um, and this last little slide really kind of shows that uh, the timing of these things is that um, it's trying to show that when you when you start active when you start being active as you're active these you know you can get new capillaries new neurons can start to develop it's sustained um, during activity but then if you stop right and it can the, the activity you don't you don't lose what you have but the rate of development goes down right so keeping the brain active staying active um, can help as we start to try to do new endeavors or if we're having dementia, you can start to have to try to, you know, it's not a cure by any means. Like, don't, don't mistake me on that. But it does help to mitigate some things to some degree. So, you know, experience dependent neuroplasticity. Um, basically, this slide just, just is a cartoon is just there to kind of show that there are many brain factors that are enhanced with exercise, everything from trigger factors, blood flow immune regulation, the neurogenesis, metabolism, neurotransmitter production, receptors, lots of things go on, lots of benefits of exercise um, that, direct, that affects brain portions, basic ganglia, the cortex, the thalamus, which can over time lead to behavior changes, motor control, cognition, our mood. Um, I would say that one of my best treated patients with Parkinson's disease is doing great because he exercises. He picked up kick, he picked up kick, he picked up boxing. Um, and I would love to think that it's my medication that has made him better, but um, it's his, I think it's his activity that's really driven the ship in that. Um, and this is an older study, uh, and I'm gonna end on this note, um, or these two last two slides, um, that executive functions also improve with activity. Um, which to me was a fascinating study that looked at the at children in their executive functions. Um, and in this California school, that their standardized scores were improved when the school implemented a specially designed fitness program to help engage them in, um, in, in sports, in exercising, and the classroom. And we started, and I think this is one of the studies that almost sparked the American heart to then start to do the, the, play, the play 60 for football uh, when they were trying to combat obesity in children to get them active. But, but part of this also involves in, in their cognition as well too, I would argue. So, so many benefits that we can see in an athlete as we exercise them, as we get them sleeping better. And that's where, you know, remind you of the three dyads, the sleep and exercise, we'll discuss consumption and eating in, in the future and also mental activity mm -hmm. in the future. But there's, I think there's so many opportunities to improve performance if we just look back at how our bodies function and what we can do to optimize that. So everyone, I truly appreciate your time. Um, hopefully this was informative, at least stimulating to get you thinking of something new. Um, I look forward to more discussions in the future. And that's it. And please feel free to contact me. This is my email over here. I love conversations and dialogues and debate about these kind of topics. So. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wright. So now we will open it up for questions and answer our Q&A session. And I'm going to let Dr. Stewart kick that off. Um, so Dr. Stewart, do you want to go ahead? Sure. And, and uh, thank you very much, Dr. Wright. Very, uh, very informative. I guess the first thing I learned from this is that uh, if I want to lose weight, I just need to think more. Uh, and then, and then maybe I'll, I'll uh, <clears throat> that'll that'll help uh, as well as exercise. <laughs> one one of the questions that that I have is on taking medications, whether it's Benadryl or whether it is 
you know, Ambien or some of the other medications as far as on the quality of sleep. Uh, and does what does that do as we're talking about the importance of sleep? Right. So great question. And the, the pharmacotherapy, I, I gave this lecture to the residents two days ago. So we're just hot off the press. <laughs> we can do. So when looking at pharmacotherapy for, for insomnia and sleep, the problem becomes there are certain categories. You have your benzodiazepines that are involved in, in, in treating sleep. You have your non-benzos. We're seeing that the side effects of some sleeping pills, for example, like the benzos, can have the next day carryover. So it can sedate you because those are GABA. Those are, you know, they work on the GABA system, which induces sleep. But a lot of them have longer half-lives. And so you can get a carryover effect, right? So the next day, people are overly tired are a little drowsy because of what they've had the night before. The other thing that's interesting is that some of the sleeping pills reduce the, they, they change the sleep architecture. So I saw the slide earlier about stage, you know, stage one sleep, stage two sleep, stage three sleep, and then REM sleep. Many of the sleeping pills actually reduce stage three sleep um, and increase stage two sleep. But stage three is when we consolidate memories, right? And so it's, like the wrong thing to do. You, 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 you sleep longer, right? But then you, but you sleep longer in the wrong stage and you don't get the benefits of sleep. And so that's where the challenge becomes that many of the sleeping pills um, don't do what they say. And, and in my experience, I give someone a sleeping pill, they sleep for great for a few weeks and then they're not doing so you no know, few weeks later and they will have to go up on it. So I typically shy away from during chronic use of sleep sleeping pills and really focus on trying to understand why they can't sleep and doing the sleep hygiene techniques. Good, thank you. Uh, if there are, uh, so what about uh, taking naps? And uh, if you are taking naps during the day, and this is as an athlete and as an adult, uh, how long uh, should those naps be? So the nap is a fun topic because now are you taking a nap because you're tired? And if, if you're tired, is there a sleeping problem? So then you correct the sleep problem, you won't need the nap, right? But lots of folks take power naps um, and those are short, quick naps. And there's, I mean, there's lots of industries being formed about these little quick power naps, little sleep pods that you've seen. And I think they're fine, I think they're good. They're usually short, less than 30 minutes. Because if you go too long, then you, then you end up waking up in your deep sleep state and then you're more groggy than you were before. So it's that quick little small power nap that's 10, 20 minutes, no longer than 30, 30 maybe even too long, um, that can kind of just re-energize you a little bit and kind of get you going. Um, but, I, but you argue too that, but if you're getting enough at nighttime, you may not necessarily need that. But if you do, that's not a problem. Especially after a big pole boy from me. <laughs> 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 Lots of carbs. <laughs> it, it sounds to me like we definitely need to invite you over to New Orleans. You're uh, you're, you're ready with uh, with all of that. Um, so when we're uh, another question. So when we're talking about uh, our athletes uh, who have had a concussion, and we're working on return to learn, return to play. Um, you know, what, what kinds of things do you recommend? Uh, you know, we've kind of been taught to allow them re to re kind of return to their baseline before we start allowing activity. Uh, what are you seeing in all of this? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's standard concussion protocols that allows you to return to play if you meet certain benchmarks. I think those should all be followed. Our society, the AA, has put out kind of protocols for that. And our, and our guys over here follow that. The part that really interests me, though, is that as individuals, when you, once you get beyond the return to play, what's that long term look like? And, and that's, it's, it's a whole other conversation when we're getting into chronic injuries over time. And are there ways to potentially mitigate that using what we just discussed, right? It's helping the brain recover in a way that is beneficial to it. And that's the part that gets me excited is that the brain is not static. That yes, yeah, something can happen to the brain, but if we do things, it's like a building block. If you're trying to build a building, but you have bad, bad material, it's not gonna rebuild better. It's not gonna rebuild stronger if you try to repair it. 
But if you give it the right you know, precursors, if you give it the right sleep, the right nutrition, the right amount of exercise, maybe you can refortify and strengthen. And that's the part that really gets me excited. So I think there's more to come on that, on that topic of, of the concussions and then what do you do in the long-term return to play. Um, but there's, but right now I would say follow the standard protocols, but I think there's opportunity for new protocols that may have longer effects um, in, in a player's career. And, and on the concussion question, uh, you know, we kind of go through this making sure that, uh, you know, once we know that they're safe, that a lot of sleep is okay, that that's actually when the brain is healing. Is that kind of the, kind of your take on all of that as well? Yep. So once you've wrecked, once you make sure that there's no, there's no um, ominous causes of while you're sleeping, i.e. intracranial pathology that's going to yes. make them sleepy, right? You know, yeah, you do want them to be able to get adequate sleep, right? And let them have a, a, a fair and balanced workout schedule once they've met their markers. But no, but sleep, yeah, sleep is what we repair. So that's, that's, there's, it's fine in that case. But yeah, but rule out all the bad things first. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Uh, if there are no other questions, uh, thank you uh, for your time uh, and your expertise. Uh, very informative. Uh, Tess, you want to uh, kind of uh, close us off with, uh, with everything? Yes, thank you. So thank you again, um, Dr. Wright, and we're going to look forward to the next, hopefully, um, uh, in the series, talking about that brain, looking a little bit more at that nutrition and all that uh, um, on the second phase. Upcoming events for uh, the Center for Sport, we will be hosting a women's sports medicine webinar. So um, as soon as we have the date, we'll put that out. It's going to be featuring Dr. Mul Mary Mulcahy. Um, she is uh, one of our faculty at Tulane and practices at Tulane Institute of Sports Medicine with Dr. Stewart. And then um, if you have visited our website, you can see, uh, dig deep into the master's degree in sports studies that the Center for Sport offers. Um, there is a deadline for an application for the fall is August 1st, so you can um, visit our website and check out all the information on that. For this event, um, if you are a physician, uh, there will be a link provided for the CME um, credit. And if you are an athletic trainer or hold another degree, you will receive the course evaluation and assessment. And then upon completion of that, you will receive your certificate. So if at any time anyone has any questions, you can email Center for Sport underscore education at tuning.edu. And we look forward to everybody coming back to our ne next webinar. Thank you and have a good day. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Randall. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, looking forward to the next one. Very helpful. Yeah, hopefully it was appropriate for what you guys were hoping to come.